Hi there, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer. I'm Robin Shuckborough, and we are exploring the beautiful region of the Cotswolds in southwest England, following in the trail of Herbert Evans, who cycled around this region and wrote about his experiences in this wonderful book, The Highways and Byways in Oxford and the Cotswolds, published in 1905, 114 years ago. To get back on track, we've decided to visit a town that we ignored during our early travels. And we've never been quite sure why. Chipping Norton, commonly known as Chippy, is extremely famous. It's the centre of a social set who gathered around our ex-Prime Minister, David Cameron. And for a while, they seemed to have considerable influence. It is still the case that this area is very grand. The houses cost a fortune, the standard of restaurants, shops and services in general is incredibly high. But some of the reasons these sorts of people like it so much is its gentle beauty, its closeness to various main English cities, including London, and the fact that the locals would rather be seen dead than to pester someone simply because they're famous. If we meet anyone in our travels today, we will simply ignore them. Unless, of course, they recognise Widget, in which case we will obviously have to be polite. So come with us. We're going to show you around this beautiful town. It has a lovely church and lots of interesting buildings. Chipping Norton is built on the side of a steep hill. Its name means Market North Town and suggests that perhaps its religious rank, at least, when named, was lower than somewhere closely to the south. John Blair, our extremely useful Oxford professor of medieval history, with whom, in my guise as the chairman of the Banton Archive, I've been lucky enough to have many connections over the years, suggests that Charlbury, now a smaller and more peaceful place, was, at the time, of greater importance. The settlement started with a Martin Bailey castle built at the foot of the hill, of which now only the earthworks remain. The high street shows how steep the slope is. The houses on the east side are at least a storey higher than the other side of the street. Many of the houses, with their little courtyards and side alleys, are medieval but a lot of them were given Georgian facades in the 18th century. There's no doubting the prettiness of the street, despite the fact that traffic is often heavy through the town and modern lorries, out of scale with the buildings and the street, thunder their way through with a relentless determination. Perhaps the reason I avoided this town is that my dentist is here. In fact, they're in the building behind me here. A wonderful bunch of dentists, to whom I've been trusting the welfare of my teeth for a couple of decades now. But what I didn't know until I started to research the history of the town was that the building they're in is truly and spectacularly important. It is here that in 1971, Richard and Mike Vernon set up the Chipping Norton recording studios. It was the first residential recording studio in the country and it operated for 28 years. Most importantly, it was here that one of the greatest saxophone riffs ever played was recorded. Those of you who remember Baker Street by Jerry Rafferty will know exactly what I mean. Having got over that excitement, we're going to carry on showing you round. In the centre of the village, if you take the lanes down the slope towards the church, you come across a very pretty set of almshouses. They were built by one Henry Cornish in 1640, a very familiar demonstration of the inclination of wealthy people to show their good nature and generosity at a time of a breathtaking gap between rich and poor. Just a little further down the lane, you come across the Church of St Mary the Virgin. 
Of this church, Evans writes, It appears to have been built in the decorated style and to have had its nave rebuilt and its splendid clerestory added in the 15th century. The large square windows of the clerestory on the north and south, together with its fine east window over the chancel arch, have a very imposing effect. They ensure abundance of light, while the piers of the nave, which are carried up between the windows to the roof, add the impression of height. The tower was built in 1823. The original tower, a very good one, to judge from Skelton's plate, having been taken down. Why, one would be glad to discover. It might have been thought that after what had taken place not so many years before at Banbury, the pullers down of ancient buildings might have had the fear of such evil doing before their eyes. You'll have seen, as we've wandered around the town, how busy the place is. Um, it's a thriving metropolis these days, but Evans, when he was writing in 1905, was not quite so complimentary. He wrote, I hope no patriotic citizen of Chipping Norton will look askance at me for saying that the visitor to the town will not be overwhelmed with sightseeing. There is, of course, the cloth factory, and Chipping Norton Tweeds have quite a local reputation, but today, when we have walked around the town and visited the church, we shall be ready to start on our return to Oxford. He obviously felt that this place wasn't anything like what we see today. He also said Chipping Norton, though holding the rank of the third town in the county, is little more than a name to the outside world. It lies on no great thoroughfare. It is true it has a railway station on the Banbury and Cheltenham line, down at the bottom of the hill, but for every 500 people who pass through the junction four miles away, I doubt if more than one passes through Chipping Norton itself. It's only just possible to imagine how quiet a place it must have been in those days. It's remarkable what a difference 120 years makes. The High Street is obviously the focal centre of the town, but search down the side streets and you find Chippy's special little extras. It's theatre, one of the most successful regional theatres in the country, but whose appalling problems we can only guess at after the Covid disaster of the last year, is one building that your explorer hopes with a passion will reopen in all its glory as soon as possible. It would be a tragedy to lose such an amazing facility in our county. We'll keep an eye and we'll let you know. At the other end of the high street we find a small museum. Now obviously I would very much like to encourage all of you to visit any local museums you come across. This one has a wonderful collection of old photographs. The spectacular neoclassical town hall, built in 1842, is a hugely important part of the village's social life. Events of all kinds are held here in the two rooms, one above another, and it's exciting to think that they'll soon be ringing again to the voices of people enjoying themselves. On Boxing Day, the Haythrop Hunt has met in this square for centuries. I came here first in the 1950s to see the gathering, and since then many times latterly with my own children, usually ending up with a delicious meal in the suitably named Fox Pub at the end of the street. The imposing Bliss Mill on the west side of the town was built as a tweed mill in 1872. Chipping Norton Tweed gained a considerable reputation and provided employment for many of the locals. It closed in 1980 and has since been converted into flats. It's a microcosm of something we're always aware of in our travels, the change in priorities over the last century. This extravagant building was put up with respect to the Industrial Revolution and for people to make things in. And we, appreciating the beauty and quality of the building, use it to live in. 
it seems we are prepared to pay a substantial premium to do so. Leaving Chippy along the A44 going west, we're heading past the wonderful house of Chasselton, which we fully intend to visit properly soon, through the village of Evenlow to Broadwell. A lovely, peaceful village, just a smidgen north of Stowe on the Wold. Broadwell has it all. A broad village green, ringed by lovely Cotswold stone cottages, a gentle stream running through the village, a popular inn behind me, and a Norman church full of interesting monuments and artefacts, which take me straight back to my early teens. The church is closed today for reasons only too obvious in view of the fact that we're here at the beginning of 2021. But it was one of the many little churches I explored with my brother in the late 1950s and early 1960s. I remember climbing the tower steps to the roof, something you're certainly not allowed to do these days, and surveying the incredible view from up there. It's amazing how little has changed. As you can see, we have arrived on a spring day when the flowers are simply spectacular. St Paul's Church dates in part to the 12th century but was added to and altered over the years, not least in the 19th century. During the later Middle Ages, the manor belonged to the Benedictines, who were extremely powerful in this part of the world. Broadwell is mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086. At that time, it had only 46 inhabitants. In 2011, there were 355, and the population was slightly declining. Soon we'll discover exactly how many live here now, as this is a census year in the UK. This huge village green was donated to the village by Lord Ashton quite recently in the late 20th century. And down beside the green runs a classic Cotswold shallow stream a tributary of the even load, the road fords the stream, which is no more than a few inches deep, in a way that's quite familiar in these parts. The Fox Inn, a pretty classic country pub, has the slightly less familiar privilege of being able to serve beer made in the nearby village of Donington, which is where we are headed next. Donnington, a hamlet in the parish of Stowe on the Wold, a mile and a half north of Stowe, is divided in two by the A424. The hamlet is tiny and entirely residential, except for the wonderful brewery. But during the Civil War, the Royalists under Lord Aston were defeated here in 1645 by the parliamentarian Colonel Morgan. This defeat was closely instrumental in the subsequent surrender of the King's garrison at Oxford. On the western side of the main road is the 19th century Donnington Mill and adjoining brewery. Both are built of the local oolite stone and stone slate tiles. The two-storey Four Bay Brewery is rectangular in plan and Arkell's Donnington Brewery was established on this site in 1865. Until as recently as 1959, all power for the brewery was supplied by the two great water wheels. They're still used occasionally. This beautiful lake is home to a bevy of swans, a few of which are black. I've always thought black swans to be the most elegant of birds, and they've been used for many years as the logo for this wonderful brewery. Ross and I bought bottles of each of their range, and frankly, we had an extremely happy afternoon.
Dropping back into Broadwell from Donington Brewery, we pass straight through the village until the little country lane reaches the A436. We turn left down the hill, over the bridge, past the turning to Adelstrup, of which more in a little while, and take the first turning right to Dalesford. It's a tiny village, it's one of the very few left in the Cotswolds that are entirely owned by the estate on which they were built. They're small settlements, they were mostly of course built for the workers of the, on the estate. These days there aren't many workers on an estate of this kind, um, but that's what they were there for. And there was a tradition amongst these great estates that they would provide housing for their staff, for their families, for the rest of their lives. It was here that a crop was introduced to the area called Sainfoin, sometimes known as Holy Clover. It was largely grown as fodder for sheep and cattle on the Cotswold, as well as on the chalk downs. The blaze of brilliant pink produced by acres of it in full bloom is a distinctive feature in the landscape. Evans, our faithful travelling companion over the Cotswold, describes a cheering prospect described from afar by the glad eye of the cyclist as he journeys over the worlds in the early summer. The Sainfoin is a native plant, but it began to be grown as a regular crop on the Cotswold in the middle of the 17th century, many years before turnip fields came into fashion. Its cultivation is said to have been introduced into England by the squire of Dalesford of the day. Writing as he was in 1905, Evans carries on with this enchanting description. Dalesford, the home of Warren Hastings, a great 18th century English man of politics, lies on our left as we descend the hill from Chastleton to cross the Evenlode at Adelstrup Bridge. The mortal part of the great statesman lies beneath the altar of Dalesford Church. For though he was buried outside the old church, the new church, erected in 1860, was extended eastwards to, to include his grave. In the churchyard stands a square stone pedestal supporting an urn with a simple inscription, Warren Hastings. Who does not remember the story as told by Macaulay how one bright summer day, young Warren, then just seven years old, lay on the bank of the rivulet which flows through the old domain of his house to join the Isis. There, as three score and ten years later he told the tale, rose in his mind a scheme which through all the turns of his eventful career was never abandoned. He would recover the estate which had belonged to his fathers. He would be Hastings of Dalesford. His ancestor, the Patronus of the Sainfoin, had impoverished the estate in the service of his king, and some score of years before Warren's birth, it had passed into other hands. At last, in 1788, the great statesman realised his ambition. He repurchased Dalesford, rebuilt the house, and lived there till his death in 1818. How he spent his days as a country gentleman, dividing his time between farming and literature, fattening prize cattle, and attempting to naturalize exotics, both animal and vegetable, may be read in the pages of the aforementioned Macaulay. The estate is now in the hands of one of the most dynamic families in this country today, the Bamfords. Having made a huge fortune in the manufacturing of heavy machinery, Lord and Lady Bamford have settled on this estate and they run it with all the energy and dedication they brought to the rest of their lives. We hope to revisit in detail at a later date the extraordinary farm shop, a term that doesn't begin to do it justice, where I recently did a butchery course, a birthday gift from my beloved daughter, I can't wait to show you all around. I hope you've enjoyed our little trip around Dalesford. It's a beautiful little place, miles from anywhere, in these wonderful folds of the hills. Of course, it has this one 
glorious central gem of the extraordinary farm shop. Leaving Dalesford, back the way we came, we head for the village of Adelstrup, just across the main road. I'm absolutely sure I remember the name. Yes, I remember Adelstrup, the name, because one afternoon of heat, the express train drew up there unwantedly. It was late June. The steam hissed. Someone cleared his throat. No one left and no one came on the bare platform. What I saw was Adelstrup, only the name. And willows, willow herb and grass, and meadow sweet and haycocks dry, no whit less still and lonely fair than the high cloudlets in the sky. And for that minute a blackbird sang close by, and round him, mistier, farther and farther, all the birds of Oxfordshire and Gloucestershire. Edward Thomas captures the peace and tranquillity of Adelstrup so beautifully in one of Britain's favourite poems written at the beginning of the 20th century. Edelsthorpe, Tattlestrop, Taddlethorpe, Tiddlestrop. Since the days of the Saxons, it has taken a while for the name of the village to settle on Adelstrup. It's never been anything but a small community. At its peak in 1801, when the farms relied on a substantial labour force, it had a population of around 225. Today, we await the results of the census to find out how many people live here now, but it surely won't be that many. Its literary connections don't stop with Thomas. Jane Austen visited here several times to stay in the old rectory hard by the church, where her cousin Thomas Lee lived. He was vicar here for more than 50 years. Jane's mother Cassandra's maiden name was Lee, and the family built the extraordinary Gothic manor house behind the church. The church itself is full of Lee family memorials and hatchments. They record some excellent marriages into great local families, including the Lords of Say and Seal at Broughton Castle, which we visited a couple of years back. These days, the village is home to one of the most sophisticated racing stables in the United Kingdom. Adelstrup Stables combines beautiful and traditional Cotswold life with some of the country's most modern training facilities. When you visit, you'll likely witness the timeless sight of huge, fiery steeds prancing sideways up the road, topped by strong young stable girls whose courage appears boundless. The shops have almost all gone. This peaceful village is served by one post office stroke shop where, if you're lucky, you might be able to buy a cup of tea and a cake in the summer. There are, of course, village events, usually in June, when the gardens of the great houses open and it's possible to get a glimpse of the ancient beauty of these grand estates. If you want to join in, you must keep a beady eye on the local calendar. Well, well that was quite something, wasn't it? Uh, it's a wonderful new way we found of filming these uh, little villages. I hope you enjoyed it. I really have fallen for this little village of Adelstrup. It's just beautiful and peaceful and typical Cotswolds. Drop down to the valley floor and you'll find the old railway station buildings long since turned to residential use. Just pass them and you'll come up to the A436. Turn right, cross the bridge over the river and railway, climb the hill for about a quarter of a mile and you'll see a turning left to Oddington. The village of Oddington is certainly a gem on its own, but follow the signs for the Church of St Nicholas for a treat that is truly memorable. Evans, our familiar travel companion, writes of this church, 
Shortly after leaving Adlestrup Bridge, we may digress half a mile as far as the old church of Oddington. This very interesting church now stands in solitary grandeur, hard by a coppice tenanted by rooks and quite deserted by the village, which long ago migrated up the hill to a spot nearer the common fields. Here a new church has been built and except for an occasional funeral, the silence of the old church is seldom disturbed. We, who have purposely left our road to seek it out in its seclusion, may be counted among its disturbers. Happier, they who in an April stroll by the evenload through meadow and spinney, bright with marigolds and primroses, burst upon it unexpectedly and stand fettered by the sudden spell. There's nothing to mar the quiet beauty of chancel, nave, aisle and tower. Nothing but the cawing of the rooks to break the silence. That aisle, once the nave of a small Norman church of the common Cotswold type, received later the tower at its eastern end, and then, in the prosperous times of the early Edwards, the new nave and chancel arose, and ever since it has been but the side aisle of the larger church. What he didn't know, writing as he was in 1905, was that hidden under the whitewash on the north wall of the nave was one of the most complete depictions of the doom of mankind existing in this country today. Painted in 1340, probably whitewashed before it could be destroyed at the beginning of the Reformation, uncovered in 1913 and fully restored in the 1970s, the beauty of this wall painting reduced both Ross and me to speechlessness. I quote from the excellent leaflet in the church. At the top center of the painting is a figure of Jesus, flanked by apostles and saints. And below this are two angels sounding a trumpet to awaken the dead. The bottom of the image shows the dead rising from their graves to be judged. Some are awaiting admittance to the gates of heaven, while others are being dragged into hell, where the fearsome figure of Satan, surrounded with his imps, awaits them. It is a truly remarkable survivor from medieval times, and is most certainly my gem of the month. The church relies on donations from visitors for its survival, so do visit and remember to leave something in the box. We'll see you again soon. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. You can find us on all the other platforms and we'll see you next week. Goodbye.